Hi, I'm Michael Tanella with Tux Digital and the Destination Linux Network. And this video is going to be a little bit interesting because I am going to be traveling back in time and showing you a video from eight months ago. Now, that might seem a little weird. It definitely is weird, but I was at a conference eight months ago. Well, not exactly eight months, but close. And at that conference, I did a couple talks. One of those talks is a video editing with Caden Live, and I wanted to put it up on the channel. But there were some issues, unfortunately, that came into uh, dealing with like the video from the conference wasn't uploaded, uploaded for a couple months, actually a few months. And then when it was uploaded, there were some audio issues and you couldn't hear certain things. And I had to do some overlays to fix like the questions at the end and all that sort of stuff. And the video I recorded, well, somehow I lost it. But I also did a backup of the audio specifically, so I didn't lose that. So in the grand scheme, it's a well-collected video of about four different pieces and uh, it, it'll work. So, well, I guess you can let me know if it works or not. There's a few, th since it's kind of old and uh, a lot of the stuff in it is accurate, but some of it isn't. So I edited, about, I edited out some stuff from the talk that isn't relevant anymore, but a couple things are relevant that are kind of like some issues or some bugs. And I did report them, although it was this week that I reported them, so they're not they're not fixed yet, which I would say that's probably my fault considering it took me that long to do the video and then let them know of things. But, you know, it happens. <laughs> also, uh, and one of those things is uh, this matte transition thing we get to later in the effects. And this particular uh, effect does not work at the moment of recording, but I have been told that it has been fixed. So in a f uh, pretty soon in a, really a soon future release, they will have that fixed. So that's great. Uh, and also, for in the video, I talk about a custom keyboard, and since I'm actually here, I can show you the custom keyboard. And this keyboard allows me to have special macros and stuff, specifically for Caden Live, to control my editing faster. If you're interested in this, let me know. I'll do a product review, and uh, I can go ahead and put a link in the bottom in the description if you want to just get a link to link to it and whatever. But if uh, if you are interested in finding out more about this thing, please let me know, and I'll make a product review about it because I do think this is pretty awesome. So let's get to the conference talk. And you may see a few things here and there where I jump in and be like, okay, this part's fixed. Just so you know, I have done some edits to the talk to improve it to more accurate times. Let's get started. Thanks for coming. This is the talk about Caden Live and just video editing in general, but specifically for Caden Live. I'm gonna do beginner stuff as well as some advanced stuff, as more of a demonstration of the advanced stuff that you can do in Caden Live, not necessarily a like a like a full. I'll, I'll I'll explain one of the main advanced stuff I'm gonna do, and I'm also gonna show you how I speed up my production and it just there's certain tips that you can do to make it easier to use Caden Live. I'm Michael Tanell, and I'm one of the hosts of Destination Linux and the creator of and host of This Week in Linux. And I create various other Linux-related videos on TuxDigital.com. Both of these podcasts use video base, and is, so I have a lot of practice in video editing. And by the way, you can check out the websites uh, by going to uh, michaeltonnell.com, destinationlinux.network, destinationlinux.org, TuxDigital.com. And so the, first of all, I just want to get started by asking a couple questions. So how many of you have used uh, Caden Live before? Okay, nice. How many have uh, never used any video editing? Okay, so I'm going to do a couple of the of the kind of demonstration of like the basics, and then I'll go into some more you know extra features and stuff. So the timeline here is is actually going to be uh, different because this is the 1904 version. I also have the 1812 version loaded up to show it uh, because some things in 1904 are much better, and some things make it crash. So um, so we're gonna, I'm gonna show you what a really cool transition thing, but it doesn't work in 1904 yet. Uh, and I didn't know that until about 20 minutes ago. So that's why 1812 is up for it. Uh, but anyway, so this timeline is actually pretty, uh, it's pretty useful. It's gonna be difficult to do it with one hand, but like the, the best thing about this uh, st structure is that it's super keyboard friendly. The, this version is more keyboard friendly than the last one. You have basically the, the, the used to just have to right click you had to right click the uh, context menu and choose these things. Uh, now you can specify uh, shortcuts for each individual thing on the context menu, as well as pretty much any effect or any uh, feature inside of Caden Live now. So that's one of the main reasons that 1904 is going to be a good, you know, solution as soon as they fix those bugs of the crashing part. Uh, but 
for the most part, I think it's, it's, it's pretty much good to go right now. Uh, and also, the new timeline structure is really cool because if you have a problem and you tell them about it, depending on the severity of the problem, they will fix it pretty quickly. I had a really annoying bug uh, a couple weeks ago, and I told them about it, and then the next day it was fixed. That didn't really help me for that particular edit because I had to do it that day, but it's still pretty cool that they did it. The next thing I'm going to talk about is some extra differences when you use the timeline. So the previous version, when you pulled a video that had audio on it, the audio would be as attached to that video clip. And this one, they don't do it that way. They actually make it where it pulls the, the audio automatically off of it. And so you can see there's two different clips, but they're actually linked together. So if you didn't want to have the audio, you'd have to unlink them and then delete the audio piece. It's, it's not required to do this, though. You can actually go into the section over here and change the layout back to the old way if you wanted it to. But this is the new way of doing it. And they've also redesigned the overall look of the timeline because this way, the way they do the, uh, the audio thumbnails is much better because it has better contrast. As you can see, when you, when you zoom in, you can get better detail of, what, like, of the, the peaks and everything. So the previous version had some issues where sometimes you couldn't really tell what exactly the audio thing was doing because sometimes it would show you the wrong waveform. It would show you uh, not enough of the waveform and it wouldn't, and it would kind of be, they would kind of uh, bundle together. So this is a much better way of doing it. So there are, there are differently benefits to 1904. Uh, so as soon as the, the thing is completely stable, it'd be great. Uh, but anyway, this is a, uh, a, one of the tips that they, that they improved. I mean, and the overall thing that they've done as far as changing functionality, if you have used KDLab before, is they change the context menu a lot. So when you right click a clip, you used to be able to go down to the add effect and then just choose whatever effect you wanted to. You can't do that anymore. They've actually set it up where it's only gonna show you favorites. And it's not difficult to add a favorite, but it is kind of weird that it's both a good thing and a bad thing. Because if you were used to doing it, it's gonna change your workflow. If you never did it in the first place, it was gonna, it's gonna save you time because you're just gonna get the things you're gonna normally use. So it depends on how much you've used it and whether you've developed a workflow or not. But overall, I think that's a, a good thing to have anyway. But uh, the next thing I want to do is talk, kind of do like a, a beginner tour about the different features of it. So the first off, we're going to use the select tool, which is actually the default. So the select tool is just this right here. And that's the regular mode of being able to select clips. It's not really that important. It's more of like the default because it's just the most normal usage of it. But there are other tools that you can change like the mode. There's the razor tool and the razor tool allows you to randomly, you know, cut clips like that. Then there's the spacer tool, which allows you to move clips based on the track. And then you can just move around like that and it'll also the, one of the reasons the spacer tool is really cool because if you pick to move certain clips it will move everything behind it as well so it'll save you time in that sense in the same way of trying to pull it back as well but when it turns to the razor tool you can completely ignore it like it exists but it's super slow and not worth it because the select tool actually has a feature that you can do that without having to worry about it so this this arrow thing is called the playhead now you don't actually have to use the razor tool to hopefully guess with your mouse where it is. You just put it frame by frame where you want it to cut, hit shift R and it cuts it or exactly where the playhead is. So it saves a ton of time and you skip that whole mode completely. And then there's other options where you can just, once you have that, you just select the clip then hit the delete key and you're super quick cutting. So that is the one of the good ways to speed up your production because it allows you to skip all that. The next thing I wanna show about the beginner tour is, is that there's something about Caden Live that is not very obvious and they don't really promote it, but it's super helpful. So if you're doing something that's really extravagant, like a lot of effects or something and a lot of effort, and then you're trying to play it back, Caden Live is not accelerated very well, so it's not gonna give you a good, like a full preview, like an accurate preview. So it's gonna jitter a little bit and have some buffering and it's not gonna work that well. So we wanna do, is put where, put the playhead where you want it to start the effect, hit I, and then put it where you want to end, and then it's just hit O, like input output, and it creates a preview zone. And then when you go to the render, it'll ask you options, and one of those options is the select the select zone, or in some cases like the older versus preview zone. 
So you can just do that one piece of part of the zone that you want and it will allow you to render the effect, test to see if it worked very well, and then go back to do the rest of the edit. It saves, it'll save a ton of time, but you don't have to, you know, edit, record or do a bunch of like rendering of like a four hour thing or whatever and it takes forever to do it. You can just do this one piece and then go back. So that saves a lot of time. Another thing that I think is very useful about the timeline is the ability to remove space. So, so you can see this part right here. It's just if you want to pull one clip to the other, you can go to the uh, spacer tool, which can be useful at times, but also it can be slow. So you can just right click and then there's options here. One of them is remove on active track and one is remove space. If you click remove space, it will pull back the clip to where is the next snap point and then it will do the next clip, pull everything behind it and leave it in the same proportions of where it was and you pull it with it. Or you could do the right click and choose the active track and it will leave everything on every other track alone. So you can choose to do this. And the weird thing about some of the stuff in Caden Live is that there are stuff in the shortcuts where their labels different. So for example, the remove space set is remove space means the remove on the active track. Whereas on the right, the context menu, it means all the tracks. Then the other option to just do the, the full all tracks inside of the shortcuts says all tracks. So it's a you have to pay attention to what you're setting is going to be the right one because it's kind of mislabeled. And I think that's from the previous version where it used to they used to have the same styling. They just changed the context menu. So a quick ninja edit here to let you know that this bug has been fixed. So in the next release, they're going to have the remove space and the confusing pieces of the shortcut and the timeline and all that stuff completely fine. So awesome. Just want to let you know that while technically it is true for the current release, it will be fixed very soon. Now, the other one is if you there's a really cool feature that for some reason is not active by default in Caden Live. You have to go in and ma manually do it. Uh, there's a shortcut that allows you to create a screenshot of the frame that you're looking at, and it will automatically create that clip. You can put it in your folder or you can make it go to your project bin automatically. So there's lots of different benefits to using the like as far as speeding up, but the shortcuts are the most powerful because you, you should, I mean, I don't really like the defaults of how they have the shortcuts because they're kind of awkward in some cases. But once you change them up a little bit, it makes it a lot easier. So one of the things I did want to show you is that when you want to go frame by frame, you do uh, left and right. If you want to go one second at a time, you hold shift and go left and right. But the, the most powerful one is the alt and left and right. And that is the clips, the snap clips jump. So you actually go in the front end of every clip and also the preview zones. So you can do that. And it saves a ton of time to jump back and forth. So that's one of the best things about the navigation for the timeline is that it makes it so easy to navigate through it. This is one feature you can also do is control and then home, which I can't do with one hand. So I'll just tell you what it does. Control. Home will take you from the beginning and the end of the entire project. Or to also control home control in beginning and then end. That's some, some of the speed up process. Now there's there's things that I do that I can't really ex like explain in the talk because it requires special equipment. Like if, for example, I have a custom keyboard that is like a macro keyboard, so I have really custom shortcuts that are stupid, like um, Super Alt F3 or something like that. There's no reason to do those, but the reason I have them is because it allows me to customize everything in here to my setup for my keyboard and also not have to worry about any conflict with anything else because nothing else uses those weird shortcuts. So except for Plasma has weird shortcuts, but that's not important. So th this is this it makes it possible to have uh, really quick modifications. So I have a keyboard that's like a small one handed macro keyboard. So I'm just switching back and forth between every little piece. So I, it allows me to have do like the alt left on one key so I can go super fast to do everything. So that's one of the things that like makes my workflow super fast is that. Uh, and then I wanted to show you some, uh, some effects as well as some ideas of how I do editing. And one of the things that is super useful in editing is the guides tool. There are shortcuts by default, but I don't remember what they are actually, because I have a custom keyboard for it as well. 
And it's on the timeline. Yeah, it's the guides here. And when you add a guide, what it does is puts a guide right here. And this guide will allow you to, you know, not have to have a clip there and still be able to go use the alt and left key to jump to that guide. And that saves a ton of time in, as well because it allows you to put like pre-set up what cuts you want to do and then go in and make the cuts. So for example, when I do Destination Linux editing, I have an automation tool where while we're recording the show, I have a, the macro has a timestamp being a recording of the time of when we started the recording. And I hit the button to apply a timestamp. And then from there, I make an automation thing where I take the timestamp and turn it into a guide in Caden Live. So when I open Caden Live to edit Dest Destination Linux, all of the edit points are already set for me because I have an automatic set for the guides. One of the, the cool things about the 1904 version of the guides is that you have a lot more customization. You can choose the color of the guides. You can also choose to give it names. So I have an automatic thing where if I make a mistake, then I put myself as the edit point. If Ryan totally screws up, like always, I put a, I put a mes message saying, this is where Ryan screwed up the entire show and you have to fix it. So uh, there, there's things like that that happen. And I think that the, if once you get used to the process, you'll get it's really quick process. It's a super fast production time, but it does take a while to get used to all of the settings. It's it's KDE, so that's one. Yeah, you know everybody gets that. Uh, my 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 method is super custom, but it's not like gonna be a plug and play thing because you have to have the exact keyboard I have. You have to have all this other stuff. So the the next thing I want to talk about is some effects that you can do in Caden Live. This is called a matte transition video. Now this video is apparently, it looks like it's just basically nothing. So it's a transparent background video. So what you do is you see these white things pop up and it, it basically looks like it's nothing special because it's just this weird video playing. But what it's actually doing is this. So it allows you to transition from one video to another video with that transition video. And the transparency effect allows you to reveal the, net, the below video through that structure. So you can make that animation be anything you want it to be. And it allows you to uh, basically have any kind of transition, not just a fade, not just a whatever. You can make it custom to the layout and landscape of it. Like for example, there's sometimes where I saw uh, there's a, a, a guy I helped do some uh, work with. He did a, some, a video shoot on a mountain. I'm not going to go up to that mountain, but I can make a transition so it looks great where it kind of like fades along the mountainside while they're skiing, and then it shows the next scene. Like that's a pretty cool effect. And the way you do it is this process. So the first clip you want to have in the, dis in the display of it, you want to use at the very bottom of the track. Then you want the next clip on top of it, and the, however long the matte transition is, that's you just have to deal with however long it is, so you have to know where you're gonna cut. So you do have to prepare if you're gonna use these. Uh, and then you just set up a matte transition to apply to auto, and then set that on the top of everything. So it has to go from the, the one you start with, then the next level you wanna go to, and then the transition on top of that, that will compensate and, and uh, then do, deploy, uh, apply all its magic. So that a lot of people are not going to be using, but it's a really cool effect that you can do as an advanced tool in Caden Live. And this is the example I was talking about where it would crash the new one. So I attempted to try it three times and we're like, okay, it's crashing literally every time. So here's 1812 where it doesn't crash. So quick ninja edit here. At the time of me saying this statement that it doesn't work in the newest version, that was true but I'm happy to inform you that that's no longer an issue in an upcoming release. So it is still an issue in the current release, but the issue that was causing this crash was found and corrected by the MLT project, which is awesome. So an upcoming release of Caden Live will have this fixed. So this is a good example of the preview render as well. So when it starts doing it, it's not gonna be able to do it very well. So it's just going to jitter and stuff and it, you can you can see it's happening but you're it's not a good representation so that's why you would use the preview render for that and or just make a tiny video and just put it there you could also do that if you wanted to so i think caden live has a lot of benefits i think that it's overall it's a great uh, tool to use and i think that over if you wanted to 
you could customize it to do basically anything you want except render fast. Be <laughs> yeah, because it, so depending on how long your video is, it could be forever. Uh, I, occasionally, I'll have it where the video for Destination Linux takes four or five hours. And that's just because if you do stuff like this, you do extra, eff eff extra effects, it's going to add a lot of time. So while this is still true that rendering is not the best, I recently upgraded my hardware to an AMD 2700X. And I realized that it was mostly my hardware that couldn't run it. And also in this presentation, it was because it was a laptop, so it couldn't run the rendering very well or the preview very well. Now that I have a 2700X, my render times now are great because AMD 2700X is awesome. Basically, I'm saying that the, it's just the, really the hardware. It's the, it's the bottleneck of the hardware. There is a technically possible thing. Uh, this is an advanced tip as well. There's a feature in Team Green that, ha that NVENC exists, and you can apply NVENC in, open, in, K in Kden Life, but you can't really do it very well exactly because you, you have to also install Shotcut take the library features of Shotcut and then impl implement them inside of Caden Live. So it's a really weird way of doing it, but it's technically possible. So uh, if you wanted to do it, that'll speed up your renders. Uh, it's, it is useful, but they are working on video acceleration for just the itself. So you, the AMD improvements will be coming in a future release when I have no idea. But I'm a huge fan of Caden Live because of how much power it gives you. By default, it looks kind of cumbersome. If you were to use OpenShot, it's a lot easier. It's more of a like a, a iMovie or a Windows Movie Maker approach. But this one has so much more power and it can do a lot more and a lot faster that I am just a big fan of using the of using Caden Live for the most, most part. There are a ton of different things you can do. There are a ton of different features I haven't talked about. And unfortunately, there's just too much to discuss as far as like, going through each effect and each thing that you can use. But one of the best things about Caden Live is it has a lot of key frameable aspects. And that allows all your effects to be able to apply a key a keyframe to your effect and then change the effect in the keyframe directly on the clip. So I don't have a preview of showing you that because I just thought of to tell you right now. And uh, you just go into the, the effect panel, which would be right up here. And then you just choose, like, you, here's what I want a keyframe. You, you add a keyframe button, then you change the value, go to the next part of the video, add a keyframe button, change the value, whatever, whatever else you want. And that it allows you to do audio changing, some transformation changes and all kinds of uh, opacity settings and whatever you want. Keyframing is available in uh, Caden Live and it works quite well. Now, there are also like a lot of effects like chroma keying and a ton of things that you have to have equipment to make it work. But for the most part, the majority of what you would want to do in Caden Live is totally possible and totally easy to do once you know how the shortcuts work because they're a little esoteric and odd. But are there any questions as far as, you know, Caden Live? All right, go ahead. Well, like this is when I start just your regular workflow. Mm -hmm. Do you have a couple of cameras and you want to grade them so it looks consistent? Do you do that in Caden or do you have a different tool that kind of gets you your baseline so you can start editing? Are you talking about like the coloring grading? Yeah, like this can camera is like, yeah. So there's there's the the best way to do it is to do it separately. So you want to have have the video side by side and try to figure out what color grading you want to do, and then edit that one video to get the color grading correct. The you and I would say that the best way to do it is in Caden Live because it does have color grading in it. Um, as far as open source wise, like you could use Lightworks and it'd probably be a lot easier. Because uh, Lightworks does have a, a, a really good color grading system inside of it. But Caden Live is the best open source approach to it. So I would say use Caden Live to d do the editing of individually of that color grading, not in the full project. Because if I was, if I needed to do that, because there's sometimes, I don't know if why you specifically chose the color blue, but there's a couple episodes where Destination Linux where my face is blue a lot from a wallpaper. And uh, the choice to fix it is to go in and color grade my video and then re-render that section and put it into the podcast and re-render the whole podcast. So the method I used was to ignore it. And you know. <laughs> So, any, any other questions? That transition, is that a resource that's taken from Live or do you have to go find that? You have to find them. The transition effect is, is built into Caden Live. 
the actual animation itself is not a Caden Live thing. That is a video that you, there's a ton of different uh, presets because this, the, one of the cool things about that style of transition is that it is, uh, it's very popular and also works in literally every editor that has the ability to do matte transitions. So any, any editor that has compositing or full compositing can do that. So if you have some, if you find a template that is for uh, Premiere Pro or, you know, Final, Final Cut or whatever, it will still work. It doesn't matter what kind of video it is. As long as it is a, a transition video where it has white color for the, the animations coming in and then transparent background for everything else. Zeb? Do you have your sources where you go and find your best transitions? Do you mean, do I have a list of my things or do I have a things in the notes or whatever? Here, you know, look at a site that has various transitions that you can utilize. That's a good question, and there will be, when I post it online, there will be, yes. Like right now, no, but there will be. There's multiple libraries and stuff, so they don't work for anything. You got another one? Is there an easy way, a shortcut to, like when I was doing the best place where it makes sense, I would do the outtakes, and they would be 30 seconds, like 20 seconds, 10 seconds. They would be at the very beginning or at the very end. Yeah. So is there an easy way to take that? Oh yeah, good good question. Because I totally forgot to do that. Because uh, there's a super easy, uh, when I was explaining the, the alt left and alt whatever, if you, have, if you want to take a video and then do an outtake, you want to put it all the way at the end, if you just click the clip, hold it down, and hit control end, it will move your timeline all the way to the end, and then you just let go of the clip and it'll be at the end. Yeah, so it's, it'll take uh, like two seconds. There's another question over here. Yeah, um, you may or may not know the answer. I do. <laughs> I do a lot of editing in a, in a premiere. Is, is Caden Live going to work on getting a, the ability to speed up rendering with the NVIDIA Kubo cores and the graphic GPU? More than likely it will uh, because of the NVENC support for the encoding. It, it could use that. Uh, it's technically possible to do it, and they have discussed whether they're going to be able to like allow you to choose it as a preset for the render. Uh, so you're, they're going to not necessarily preset, but like the variable parameters, you can add that to it. They're talking about adding it as an option, but they haven't done it yet. But they have discussed it. Yeah, in a large, in a large amount, it has to be with the render itself. So yeah. that's true too. And also, just rendering, and if you don't have hardware acceleration, rendering is a is a chore. Unless you have a thread ripper then it's amazing. I don't have one of those, but I've seen it done, so. Oh, wow. Okay, so have I ever used Cinelera and why do I hate it? Okay, I can give you a, re I don't hate it, but it is an awkward editor and not in the sense of how you use it. The, the problem with the, with the Cinelera I found is that there are way too many Cineleras. There's like five different versions of Cinelera. And when I promote a, a particular application and I go, well, Cinelera is great. And they're like, well, which one do I get? Because this one didn't work. Well, you have to get this one that's a fork of this fork and this fork. And that's why I don't really like to promote Cinelera because if it's, it's a pretty good tool. I would say it's on par with KDE in many ways, uh, or Kden Live, I mean. And I don't think it's not necessarily a bad editor. I just think that they need to rebrand it. And whoever has the latest community version, because there's like a CV version or something, like that needs to just be rebranded and get rid of the name Cinelera, get anything else, because it doesn't, it's just, it's too complicated for, even for technical people to find it because uh, it's not worth the effort, really. I, uh, I, I edit video once every four years, whether I like it or not. And the last time I said, I tried it, I tried to use uh, OpenShot, I tried to use Live. I got completely turned around and came live and just don't I just oh, yeah. the shortcuts are really helpful. But if you're just a guy who just you know, I, I guess I need a Mac when it comes to video editing. No, 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 no. You can definitely never never even suggest such a horrible thing. Um, <laughs> so uh, so I think that the, the, maybe the question was about the uh, open shot, yeah. the open shot aspects and the yeah, the Which different editors. Yeah, there's a lot of different editors that are in uh, Linux. Which is weird because we have, we, we have like one option for a solid email client, 
on the desktop, and we have like 15 video editors. But there's OpenShot is an interesting thing because it's it's got some cool features. The Blender structure that they have for the automated animation titles that's a really cool feature. But there are some issues with OpenShot in the sense that it has uh, it's missing a lot of features that I that are pr production wise are necessary. Like it doesn't have most of the effects that are in Caden Live. It doesn't have quick jumps as well as good as Caden Live has. Uh, it's a it's, and some some versions is a little crashy. That's true. But also you know it happens in all of them. But there's different benefits to all of them. Uh, I think Shotcut is a really good editor too. If you want to check it out, it's it's a uh, it's a very unique method of editing. Uh, but the the reason why Shotcut is worth checking out is it's a workflow that kind of feels natural. So if you want to do a transition on Caden Live, you basically put a clip over another clip and then hit the corner of one of the clips, whichever one's on top, and then it'll transition to the next one. And that's kind of awkward, but it works fine. It, with, uh, with Shotcut, you just kind of drag the clip, hover it over a little bit, drop it, and it creates the animation automatically. Like That's a pretty cool feature, so it feels more natural. But at the same time, the rendering, it needs work. The rendering issue is that if you want to have a really high quality thing, you have to tweak it all the time. And when it exports, sometimes it'll export really slowly and the file will be gigantic. I've had times where I rendered something in Caden Live, took the exact same work I'm, and then built another thing in, in Shotcut. Shotcut took three times longer and the file was four times larger. So that shouldn't happen. But it, that's what it, for me, in my experience, is what it does. So there are all of a lot of options, but I think Caden Live is the most well-rounded option of all of them as far as the open source options. If you want to talk about Lightworks or DaVinci Resolve, which is terrible. Uh, yeah. Another quick Ninja edit, and that is because I said DaVinci Resolve is terrible, but I'm meaning just because the support in Linux is hit or miss. You know, sometimes you can get it installed and it'll work fine. Sometimes it won't. And overall, the editor is quite good, but getting it working in Linux is sometimes a pain. And therefore, I think that's a terrible experience. DaVinci Resolve just needs to make an app image or a snap or a flat pack and be done with it rather than the weird way they do it now. Yeah, there's there's t there's tons of different uh, features or options if you want to check them out. But I think Caden Live is by far the best once you learn all of the weird shortcuts and st structures. Back there. Just a quick question on, on, on how long would it take to be efficient? How long would it take to be efficient in Caden Live? Okay. The trend, it depends on what they do. If they use Premiere in the sense that some people use Photoshop in the sense that they use it because they don't, they just think it's, 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 they're told it's the best and therefore they use it, but they don't really use, utilize anything that's super special to Premiere, then it's a pretty easy transition. But if they've been using it for a certain amount of time, the transition of shortcuts are going to be completely different because there's not a single shortcut that's similar. Well, okay. The only one that's similar is the delete key. They remove a track. And also one of the biggest features of any kind of editor is having the, like if a lot of people would kind of argue, disagree with this point, but I think if you're going to zoom on a timeline, the video track is irrelevant to that zoom. The only thing that matters is the audio track and the audio thumbnail. So you want to be able to zoom in exactly where you want to cl cut that audio. The newest version of Caden Live has that built into it much better because of the how there's the contrast is so much better. So when you zoom into it, it makes it a lot easier. So that's why if you look at the thing, it's basically the, the video track is worthless. It's just a small thumbnail and you don't care about that. But that audio track, you can be very precise on the edit. And if you don't have the audio track, you're just basically guessing. So there's some editors that don't have audio thumbnail waveforms, which is basically, in my opinion, makes that editor not even worth bothering. Is there any more questions? There you go. Questions. First, can you extend the video thumbnail out? One, have a whole series of clips, or I guess not. Well, I mean, I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not sure what you mean by where, where it shows all the frames. Yeah, can you replace the blue with frames? Oh um, no, not in Kaden Life. Not that I'm aware of. So we're gonna do a quick ninja edit right here to let you know why I said these things. Because unfortunately in the talk, I didn't go any further. I just kind of moved on because someone else asked a question really quickly. So just to take a moment to let you know why I'm saying this about 
the video thumbnails, and how they're pretty much worthless. Let's first talk about why the audio waveform is the reason why zoom is necessary. So first of all, we have the waveform that is on the audio track that when you zoom out all the way or in like the standard form, you'll see it's just a bunch of jarbled stuff together and you really can't edit using it. When you zoom in, you're able to actually see the waveform of each individual word depending on how far you zoom. And that allows you to more easily, more accurately edit something without having to look at the frame and like listen over and over and over. You just listen to it once, look at the waveform it is on, and then you can compare and contrast and then just edit the part where the waveform that you don't want is. And it makes it a lot easier to actually do precision editing. The reason video thumbnails on the timeline is not very useful is because the size of the thumbnails has to take in consideration that you can see everything. So in order to see everything, you also have to zoom super far in to the point where the waveform of the audio is now indistinguishable again. And the reason you have to zoom so much is because videos are recorded at a lot of frames per second. So you have anywhere between 24, 30, 60 frames per second. So in order to see the difference frame by frame, you have to zoom in so much that it's just not valuable in order to do that. So for example, let's say you have a 10 minute video and that video is recorded at 30 frames per second. The total amount of frames you have is 18,000 frames. Now to have 18,000 frames and then put that on a timeline and having to zoom, it becomes basically unusable to have thumbnails on the timeline because having that many frames is just not valuable, especially considering when you have the preview monitor right at the top of the application, you can press the left and right arrow keys on your keyboard to see the difference between frame by frame, and it's just a lot faster to see a bigger version and also to have more control as to what you're seeing at what any given time rather than it being spread across the entire timeline. The reason for this edit that I wanted to give more details on that statement is because I realized during the editing process that I wasn't very clear as to why I was saying it, so it seemed to be more of a jab at Caden Live. But actually, most editors don't do the having the th frames on. I've honestly, I've never even seen one that did. Like for example, Premiere Pro. I'll have a screenshot in the video right now to show you that Premiere Pro also does one clip, one frame at the, in, the beginning and the end of the clip to show you a distinction in that case, but they don't do a zoom in and see all of them because it's just not that valuable. And I've been doing video editing so long that I don't even find any value in the standard video thumbnails where they actually just have the frame at the beginning and the end. And this is because I have file name differences that are very distinctive. I don't have the default file names that are provided with your camera and that sort of thing. Because when you record video, it's usually some kind of like random letters and numbers that usually based on the time or the date or something like that. Or sometimes if it's not a very good timing system, it's based on like the amount of videos you have on the system, on the camera or the device or whatever. So in those cases, it would need to be, you know, you have a clip difference to show you the difference of the thumbnail or you just rename the files. I personally prefer to rename the files to make sure that I know. I don't really like to have the gibberish file names in my project bin. So that's why I find video thumbnails not that useful. So let's jump back into the rest of the talk. Can I say a Boxy clips? Mm -hmm. Talk about that stuff. Oh, absolutely. It's a good question. I totally forgot about that. Should have been in the thing. So proxy clips are very important. Essentially, a proxy clip is a, a, a way to sort of pre-render in a smaller, um, a smaller file size that fits good in this preview mode. So this preview mode is never going to be your full project size unless you full screen and you're just going to do like a little quick look at it. Uh, so the proxy clips will sort of do a pre-render and make it like a 480p video or a 360p video or whatever. And it allows you to speed up the timeline and playback so it doesn't have any negative effect of, you know, your buffering, your uh, stuttering options. Is there a um, way to do like multi-cam stuff? <laughs> um, sort of. The, the, the answer is yes and no. And then like a, a cheat you could probably do is just stack the video, sync audio if possible, and then 
You can kind of do it that way. There is a, a technically a way to do multi-cam editing, but it's not really a full multi-cam editing. That's why I'm saying it's yes and no. So if you set up this, uh, that's also a good question. Another thing that I meant to talk about, thank you, right here is the multi-track view. And now this is a black workspace. Just trust me, that's what it is. So this section is that track, the top track. So you can do a side-by-side, -side, or if you have multiple tracks, you can have them in a grid, and it will show you all the tracks at once, and you can edit them all at once, but it won't render like this. So you, if you wanted to have it in this structure, you still have to go back and put them in the right position and everything. It's still only a single layer structure of the render. So if you render it this way, you'll just see the black, the black color clip, and that's it. Uh, so it's technically possible, but not ideal. The, the shortcuts that you were showing, are those things that are in the context menu, or are they just things you picked up along the way, like Shift-R and, and Home? Yeah, they are, sort of. They are listed a little bit, but not exactly. The 1812 is easier with shortcuts because they changed this stuff. Um, but the 1904 does have the shortcuts. The 1904 has improved the shortcuts by adding more things. Like, for example, in 1812, you can't do a shortcut for removing spaces. Like, you have to use the context menu. But it's not that bad because you just right click, hit a letter, and it would do it. Uh, so it's not terrible even in the older version. But the newest version has uh, has it all set up where you can basically create a shortcut for anything you want. And the shortcuts are right here. You just configure shortcut. And you can choose everything from even opening the about menu for some reason. But you can, you can do all kinds of stuff in here. And they remove spaces in here. They remove all track space and whatever is in all in here. And some of the stuff should be selected by default and have a default shortcut and doesn't. Some of these things I'm talking about, you would have to go in and add some shortcuts to it. And I can give you, uh, and when I post this video, along with the library suggested, I can pr provide uh, like a, a shortcut scheme or something if you want. So to enable the proxy clips, how do you do that? Is that a thing it's just a configuration. You just go to config Caden Live, and it's one of the settings for timeline. So yeah, there's a lot of, there's a lot of options in here. And there's the, the, the shortcuts are super awesome. And once you get used to the shortcuts, Caden Live editing is super fast. In the very beginning of Caden Live, it's, it's pretty awkward. And once you get used to the shortcuts, they're awkward too. So it doesn't matter. So you uh, made like an extension to where it adds those markers. Yeah. Yeah. It, oh, that's a good, uh, the, the, the project files are in XML. So you, can you like SCP uh, your whole process a BP server sitting on your laptop, just push it all to your main server, command line render. Absolutely. You can totally do that. You can take that once you have everything done, as long as you have the, the, the only thing about that is that the, um, the paths for Caden Live are hard coded. In the they're hard coded in the XML. So if you have the path as you know, on different folders or different locations and everything, or different drives, it makes it awkward to do that. But if it's all in the same subpath, you can do that. Because you can just make, you can just have a, uh, do like a project, like the, the way to do that, the most common solution is to have a home folder, folder specifically for editing, and then put everything in that folder. And then when you're done and you want to render it, just have a folder on the server and then have the same thing, you just have home editing, and it will automatically work fine. But if you have these files on, like I sometimes edit on different drives, it's not necessarily a great idea, but it works fine because I'm lazy sometimes. But uh, it allows you to do it that way if you have the path correct. Otherwise, it would kind of be awkward. You'd have, it wouldn't break it in impossibility. You could still uh, fix it by uh, making it search for finding those paths. So you can make it actually, if, you, if at any time you open a, a project file that says, uh, I can't find these clips. You, you, what do you want to do? It'll give you the option to find and search or find the replacement if wherever they w might be, trying to fix the path. Or you can abort it and just throw them out and replace them with like uh, color clip fillers. Or you can just delete them on the timeline. There's multiple options of doing it, but the the best option is actually kind of unfortunate because if you have a the, if you want to have a render server, you also need to have X on that render server. So you can look at that because that option is only available in the GUI. So if you do, if your path does break, you need to have you have you have to know that you can go in and fix it. So you have to have a GUI set up for it. It doesn't matter what GUI it is or like what interface it is. It just needs to have one. You said you have to have X on the server, or you're talking about a particular video clip, 
you have to have X on the server for if you want to render on a server. So like if you want to edit on your computer, send it up to a, like a server farm for the rendering. And then if you want, like you don't have to do that necessarily to create the render because you can render on the command line. But if you, anytime there's anything that messes up that you have to fix, you have to use the GUI to do it. Like it's super complicated with the XML to modify it. Like my modifications took me like a week to figure out how to make it work to do what I wanted with the guides. So it's very fickle. And then when you change any clip information, it changes a ton of stuff. So like if you just take, like for that one color clip, you just drop a color clip in, it has modified the XML about 40 lines. So it's not really, you know, automatable in that sense, but some aspects can be automated. And that's the, the example of, uh, of Destination Linux is that I automated the guide system because that's pretty simple and allows me to more quickly edit, even though there's not an automatic edit structure that way. You can't really do it automatically anyway, but that's fine because I can't really do automatic because uh, my co-hosts don't typically stick to the schedule, the structure that I want. You know, it's, it's, <laughs> so I, I always want them to give me a couple seconds for editing and they're like, yeah, we'll dilly do that. And like, oh, you hit the button to wait. So we're gonna start right now. Okay, cool. Uh, but anyway, that, that works out totally fine in most cases. The issue with the automation is that it's so complicated in XML because it's super custom. It's not really automation friendly. Any more questions? Can you um, say you have a, a music clip and to talk over that clip, you do auto ducking? Auto ducking, not exactly because that's more of an attenuation thing. And it would have to kind of scan the entire clip and then try to check to see what levels you are. So it, it would be, it would need a normalize, an automatic normalization. You have to do manually. Not exactly because you can do it across the whole clip and the whole track too. So it's kind of automatic in that sense, but not in the sense of that you just tell it and it would just figure it out and do it for you. So it's, it's not that uh, advanced there. You might be able to, if you don't mind using two tools, you could probably do that in Reaper. Yeah. For both clips and because it, it does auto duck. Yeah, Reaper's a good option too. There's 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 quite a few ways to do it. Uh, Osin Audio is an also good editor that does some normalization and some effect automation if you wanted to. But Reaper is definitely a more professional tool for it. So good suggestion there. Um, any more questions? All right. Now, is anybody here from uh, the last year's uh, uh, talk that I gave? Okay. This one I would say was probably successful. <laughs> Last year's was a complete disaster, really. Uh, there was technical problems, and it wasn't my fault. I saved it, so I'm just saying. Uh, so I want to appreciate you all coming back and dealing with it again. So uh, the Caden Live redo part due, I guess. Uh, so thank you very much for coming, and I hope this is, is helpful. If you have any more questions after the, after the, the talk, feel free to catch me in the hallway. And uh, yeah, thanks for coming. Thanks for watching this video. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you learned something about Caden Live. If you would like for me to do any follow-up uh, videos, please let me know. If I want you to do a follow-up video for the custom keyboard thing, uh, please let me know. I'll do a product review for it and give you some more details about why I like it, what's good about it, what's bad about it, because obviously no product is perfect, uh, but let me know. And also, if you would like for me to make more videos about Caden Live, such as tutorials or special things that I do to make things streamlined or you know, videos about OBS because I talk about OBS in my streamlining process. Uh, feel free to leave a comment below. If enough people are interested in it, I would definitely be happy to make a video about these things. But they're kind of like very specific tailors, so I'm not sure everybody would be that interested. So just if you are, let me know in the comments below. And yeah, so again, if you like this video, please click that like button. And if you like to see more content from me, then of course you can subscribe. If you would like to see more content from me in a bigger form, you could check out my podcast. I have actually three at the moment, uh, Destination Linux, This Week in Linux, and Hardware Addicts. So if you want to check those out, I have a link in the description for all three of those. Also go check out all the rest of the Destination Linux network because there's a lot of content and a lot of great shows. So check that out at destinationlinux.network. Link in the show notes as well, in the well, video description, whatever, same thing. I say show notes all the time in the other shows. So we just kind of, it's just normal for me now. 
If you would like to subscribe, be sure to do that. And if you would like to help me uh, be, make, create these videos and help make the channel possible, you could become a patron, which I'd very much appreciate. I already have 79 patrons right now, so it's fantastic. All these people who are helping me, I can't thank you enough. It is amazing. You make it possible for me to make this video, and I appreciate it so much. And if you'd like to become a patron to help me make these, this content, uh, please do so. You can go to check, you can go to tuxdigital.com slash Patreon or tuxdigital.com slash sponsors. And for the proper spellings, I'll have links in the descriptions as well. So thanks again for watching. I'm Michael Tunnell with Tux Digital and the Destination Linux Network. And as always, keep using, learning, and enjoying Linux.